All right. Hello. Welcome to our Zoom. Yay. Good to see a bunch of people here. And um, yeah, this is a big, this is a good topic. We, you know, I feel like we spend a lot of time being like, you're going to have to bid 20% over. You're going to have to do this. That we thought it would be good to actually spend a little bit of time saying, you know, when are the times when you could actually get a house below the asking price? Because that still happens. And that ha is happening with um, some of our closings, maybe some people I see on Zoom right now even got below ask. <laughs> so, um, and they're, they're, it's still possible. And, you know, and it, this is sort of like the part two of the last session was on like, how do you interpret the asking price? What does an asking price even mean? How does it, how does it get set? Who sets it? How do you know if it's flexible or not flexible? Or how do you know how high it's going to go? And so, we wanted to actually, this was the topic that we wanted to do first and realized that we wanted to first kind of give people some context for the asking price in general, and then jump into this. So if you haven't seen that one, you should go to our, you can click on the link in my profile on Instagram and it's on the YouTube channel there also. So I am Megan Brenwhite. I'm the head of the Upstate Real Estate team. I'm also a real estate agent. We are part of Keller Williams Realty Hudson Valley North. That is all of my legal stuff that I have to say. I see a few people from our team here. So I see Jen Brown, our chief of staff. <laughs> I see Karina Cousineau, our most newly licensed agent, but my oldest friend on this call. Uh, Angelica Ferguson, our lead buyer agent. I think I saw Marcy Langworthy. Yep, there she is. Marcy is the manager for the Upstate Curious app, which is something that we also created recently to help people connect and help us connect with some new people. So yeah, how can you get a house under the asking price? So I think that, you know, one of the things that I wanted to say is that, well, one of the first things I was gonna say is that it's very, oh yeah, so Sha, um, the market is not softening. So we just kick it off with that. Like, I think prices are going to continue to go up. So let me, let me start by saying that, you know, and this is where you have to refer to part one about interpreting the asking price is that the asking price and how much you go above or below it should not, does not equate your success in this market. So you could actually pay $50,000 above what anyone is willing to pay right now and be super psyched that you got that deal. You know, if you're keeping it for five or 10 years, I'm going to say you probably will be. So that just, I should just say that right away. So that like getting a, getting a house below the asking price is actually not the goal. It just is like something we wanted you to know as possible in case you're looking at, because what we tend to advise clients is that you should, when you're looking at new listings, you should look at listings that are around 20% below the top of your budget. Because what we're seeing with multiple offer situations, especially if you're not paying cash, that you, you, know, you might have to go 20% or more above budget to win in a multiple offer situation. So that's what we've been telling people. And so everyone's listening, very good students out there who are current buyers. And we do have a new buyer questionnaire also in my LinkedIn profile if anybody wants to get started with an agent on our team. Um, but the truth is that, you know, that isn't happening with every house. Not every house is a multiple offer situation. So, and not every house will sell the asking price. So the first thing I was going to say that I realized is not true necessarily is that um, you shouldn't even look at houses that have just come on the market if you're trying to, if they're above your budget or if you think that it's worth below the asking price because they're very likely to go into a multiple offer situation. But that's also not true. And we got one recently that we did get below asking price that had only been on the market for about a week. Um, the question, you know, for your agent to ask the other agent generally is how many showings are there? And sometimes even if there's a ton of showings, there might not be offers. So, you know, the way that our team is divided is that I, I mean, I don't even work as hands-on anymore with listings as I used to, but I've been working more on the listing side. And then we have dedicated buyer's agents on the buyer side and all they're doing, they search for houses, they show houses, 
they negotiate the deals, and then they help, they work with the transaction coordinators on our team to get our buyers to closing. And we, and what that means is that they're like constantly, all they're doing is talking to people and trying to ask questions that, you know, will help us understand better and better what people's criteria are. And then they're putting in offers or they're seeing houses. And so we're able to get a ton of information about when offers are getting accepted, what are the kind of things that make a difference, um, when there are houses that like nobody put an offer on that looked like they were going to be kind of really hot. And, you know, we're not going to give away all our secrets here just because, you know, we want to, I mean, not that I think even if we gave away our secrets, you'd be able to, you know, you still don't, obviously you don't have the relationship with the agents, like, you don't, you know, the area, like there's, there are a million reasons to work with a buyer's agent, um, FYI. And, and actually maybe I should say that first is like, you're more likely to get an offer, I think, below asking price if you work with a buyer's agent than if you decide to represent yourself. And that actually, the reason I'm mentioning that is because we we come across this sometimes and it's like the wrong, people have the wrong perception. They think if they, if they go directly to the listing agent, they're going to get a discount that the listing agent will just be like, oh, great, you're representing yourself. Like, let me give you what, like, I would have, you know, what the seller would have paid to the buyer's agent who would represent a buyer. But that is absolutely not true. Oh, thanks, Johnny. So nice. Say, I love the chat. <laughs> so it's not true. Like what happens is that the listing agent just keeps that money. That's it. I mean, there's no, like, there's no, they're not like, oh, I'm just going to, because basically the seller signs an agreement with the listing agent for whatever the commission is. Then it goes into the contract of how much they give to a buyer's agent. If a buyer's agent brings a buyer. So it's not like if they don't bring a buyer, the listing agent just gets that money. It, it just isn't honestly negotiable. I mean, the seller would have to renegotiate their agreement with the listing agent, which maybe is possible, but it's not, it's just not that likely. Also because the listing agent like us would argue, hey, we're still gonna have to do a lot of work with this buyer. We're still gonna have to help them maybe find contractors. We're gonna have to help them schedule the inspection. We're gonna have to help them understand the inspection. We're gonna have to help them with any of their questions about what they can and can't do on the property, deal with any of the myriad things that come up during a transaction here. So let me just say that like, I cannot recommend working with a buyer's agent more strongly because you are not paying anything. So that's like step number one is like get somebody. And I mean, I know the people on our team, I know how they've been trained. I know how we share information and resources. Um, and there is no world where anybody who is not here doing that um, would have that kind of the information and the connections to the other agents and all of that stuff. So that is, I would say, step one. Um, I think that the, the length of time on market is kind of an indicator. Well, this is what I was going to say. It's kind of an indicator that you can get an offer below the asking price, but it might not be. And there's, so there's two reasons. So one is that all of this depends on what the seller's motivations are, why they're selling. So let's say they put um, a house on the market and they really want to sell it quickly and they work with their agent. They, they come up with a price that they think is a good price to sell it quickly. And then they have 30 showings and nobody puts in an offer. Because everybody in those 30 showings is like, ah, oh, this is going to be multiple offers. It's going to be like wacky. We've, we've absolutely seen this happen. If they're trying to sell it quickly, you come in with an offer, you, you might be in with a shop there. You know, that's why it's always worth, I mean, it is worth putting an offer in. If, if you talk to your buyer's agent and they talk to the other agent and the other agent says there's already 10 offers here, you know, at least three are cash, most are above ask, you do not need to write your offer up. You know what I mean? Like you do not need to go through that. There's not like the odds that like seven people are going to like all fall out of the running is like 0%. But if you're like, I don't know, this house seems kind of overpriced. Like this doesn't seem like it's maybe going to get what they're asking. That might, and especially if your agent who knows the market even better says that you might have a shot. On the other side of things, there could be a house that's been on the market for eight months. And the sellers either can't sell it for less for whatever reason, like maybe it goes into short sale territory. Maybe, they, they, maybe they've decided they need a certain amount of money for retirement. Maybe they have, 
I don't know, maybe they just have an emotional attachment to it. And they're just like, I'm, we're not selling below this. So then it won't even matter. It could be eight months later and you could put in an, what you think is a great offer for something that's been eight months later and the seller is still going to say, no, thank you. So it's weird. So it, it's, it is, I would say it is a good indication. It's a good indication of being able to get an offer under asking price. It's not a perfect indication. So I, I would like, yeah, Angelica. That like, when you raise your hand. Literally every week we take out a client to see a place that's been on the market for like five months with no offers. We put in an offer and the next day there's like three other offers and we're in a multiple offer situation. It keeps happening. It's like a weird. Well, right. And that's actually also a super good point. And that is like, that's like one of those real estate truisms that like, that just like everybody has seen happen enough. And I know I like, I think I've shared my theory on this with in Zooms is that like enough other houses have come off the market or the inventory is so low in a particular category, like right at that price range or right in that style of house that all of a sudden people are like, okay, let's look at this one, you know? And so then like you do get like three offers, you know, all of a sudden. So, I mean, the other thing I would, the other thing I would like to just share here for the sake of all agents everywhere is that like, I don't think anybody lies about this stuff. Like, I mean, maybe somebody does, but like, we've heard clients say like, well, how do you know there's another offer? Like this could be BS. And it's like, I don't know, that would be so against our code of ethics. And it would be, it would be a pretty bad strategy actually for the listing agent, because if they, if there is not another offer and they scare your client away, now, now they got nothing, you know? And that actually did happen. Interestingly, that happened with a, a house that, is closing next week that um, I was training another agent on our team. And I was, it was, it was like a little, it, it was, it was higher than the top of their budget and called the agent and the agent's like, yep, have a bunch of showings. There's an offer that's like coming in. And so I talked to my client and he's like, let's just skip it then. Cause there's no, you know, it's just already at the top of the budget. So I called the agent and I said, Hey, we're going to cancel that showing. And he said, Oh, wait a second don't cancel it. There's no other offer. <laughs> and like, it's not in yet. And we don't know if it's coming in. And I don't know, like a couple showings canceled. So I feel like that might've been like, he might've been like exaggerating a little to increase our urgency, but he's not going to like outright lie. But because we did that, I believe that house was priced at like 630 and it was only the second week. So our clients ended up getting that for like 585. So that is a big discount, especially for right at the beginning, which is why I'm saying it doesn't necessarily, you know, right at the beginning is like our, our general rule of thumb. And, and we can get a gut feeling on this. So if there's a house that's super like super popular, we had one recently, I think I mentioned where four different, we had four different offers just from our team on a house that wasn't one of our listings. We knew that one was going to go way above ask, right? Like there was just no, like you could look at it and be like, oh, well, this is really underpriced. So there are ones that are like that, but then there are other ones where you go, hmm, I don't think this is going to sell for this, even in this market. So for sure, I would say that, you know, if you wait till the second week or after the first weekend, then you know, then this, then, the, then either the sellers have had a bunch of showings with no offers, or they have not had as many showings as they want or whatever. If it's still available by like Wednesday of the next week, then, and then I really do think you have a chance again, because what, what I used to sell to say to sellers, and this is so like rare that this happens now, but if you go, if you have seven showings with no offer, or we go for 30 days with no offer, that's when we lower the price. Now we get 30 showings and seven offers in like a weekend. And if we don't, it's like super disappointing. And we would talk about lowering the price. So sometimes interestingly that you could have a house with a lot of showings and no offers and those are very negotiable uh oh jen what's happening Is something happening with me no okay okay good jen was making a weird face scared me i was like is my something open here <laughs> no it's my husband no he's also good okay good no i was just kicking the husband out of the room That's oh awesome. you're kicking you're kicking your husband out of the room okay, good. okay <laughs> yeah. good. um so and I'll say that like we had a listing um, last week in Berryville 
that we all thought was going to get multiple offers in the first weekend. And it, it didn't, it was like the first one in months for our team that didn't. And so what we talked to the sellers about was like, let's include the furnishings because your house is really awesome as a really turnkey Airbnb and people really love the furnishings. So we kind of rebooted, included the furnishings in the price. They were going to negotiate it separately. So it's a little bit of a way of doing a bit of a price reduction, you know, and then we got a great offer and that's it. But like, I bet that there are people who didn't see it that first weekend because they were so sure it was going to go and going to go above ask because it was so cute, you know? So that's the thing is like, you, sometimes you gotta just like throw your hat in the ring. Um, we also had somebody submit an offer on a new listing this week. I wanna like, I'll keep things confidential, but, um, and it was, let's just say significantly under ask and it was sight unseen. And it was um, for a house that like is blowing up. It's our new like lake house listing and is cash. And so this gets us to the next point of what, you know, what are the things that get you an offer under ask? So cash can, but cash is not like, you don't get like a 30% discount, right? Like that's not, that's not reasonable. And even in a normal market, what, what we kind of, I think as a rule of thumb agents sort of look at cash offers as about 10% more valuable than financed offers, which is also something to think about, by the way. So when we say that, on average, the houses that we list go 15 to 20% above ask. If we actually did the math and looked at like how many of those were cash offers, a lot of them would have also been cash offers. They were the highest numbers and had cash. So if you have cash, you know, you're gonna be in a better position. Most people don't. But in this market, very often when there are multiple offers, there are multiple cash offers also. So that's the thing. So what I would say is like, you don't, you can't assume like, oh, we can pay cash. So therefore we're going to get an offer a house under the asking price. That's not true. You may, that may just be table stakes for that particular property, or it may be the thing that edges you, you know, gives you a little edge when you're getting, you know, when it actually comes to a multiple offer situation. So let's say you want to get a house below ask and you don't have all cash, you know, like, which is, which is how most people, you know, most people feel. I think the things, a lot of the things are just like, how do you win a house at all now? You know, which is like, look for ones with, with bad photos. That's step number one, you know, seriously, like you're not like our listings are not the ones to try and get below ask in general, because we're going to have amazing photos. We're going to have incredible reach we're gonna like market the heck out of it. We have great relationships with like agents in New York City and up here. So it's like, we have this whole network of people. So that one's not such a good one, but there are often um, different approaches to how one might list a home. <laughs> so let's say one might use somewhat substandard photos or like not mention something really important so, you know, again, using a recent example, there was a house that had been on the market for a long time. Someone in this room may know about that. And the sellers had done a ton of work that was not mentioned in the listing. They put in a new septic system, a new boiler, like they had done all of this stuff that, so what the, what the buyer sees is just that, oh, here's a house at this price. It's just not, it's just not moving. But actually what was happening is the house was actually growing more valuable during that time because they were investing tons of money into it. If that had been our listing, that would have been like, note, star, 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 new, whole new septic system installed in 2021, new boiler, you know, like you would say all this stuff because then people see that like, it's kind of the reverse of when we included the furnishings or the sellers decided to include the furnishings at our other listing. It's sort of like keeping that same price is like a price reduction for the buyer because they're getting all of this extra stuff and important, like really important stuff. So I think that that's it. So like when you see those things where you're like, I can't even tell what's going on here, you know, or like, why is this photo crooked? Or how is this possibly so blurry? Like take another couple of minutes with those listings and look for houses that are on like 
two acres instead of five plus acres because a lot of people won't even look at those. A lot of our buyers won't, but they might be just as private as the one that has five acres. And I would say, look at um, areas that people don't, aren't as popular. So they don't, they're not, they're not putting those areas into Zillow. So if you're like, I want to be in Carhongson, like maybe look in Wawarsing, which is like right next door, or even in Kingston, weirdly. Like I know, you know, so some people just draw like a little circle in Zillow and that, you know, that that's kind of how we do it too. As agents, we sort of think of a broader geographic area, but if you, you might be missing areas that are pretty darn close to cool areas that you know and love because you don't know and love them yet. And because you don't know and love them yet, probably means other people don't know and love them yet. So there are, there's probably gonna be less competition. So um, I think that, so yeah, I see a couple questions here. So the sense for how far, how far below asking is appropriate to go without, without offending the seller. So this is a weird thing in this market. My general rule of thumb was always 10%. 10% is where like, you start to hurt their feelings. Like I've actually seen people get their feelings hurt and not be able to recover. Cause they're just like, we hate this buyer. They're not serious. They don't understand the value of the house and they like can't ever really come back from it. You know, so that's like the 10% was sort of what I used to say. In this market, it's harder because the sellers are also nonstop reading how everything's going above ask and how everything's da 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 and it's amazing. So it could be that even a below ask offer could like offend them. You know, it's, I mean, like a $5,000 below ask offer. So in general, I mean, and this is, again, this depends on the skills of the agent is that like, I know that when we're presenting offers, we do our very, very best to present them in a way that is never offensive and always leaves open a room for, leaves open room for negotiation. And sometimes it's just like, you're just trying, you just like send a little test balloon out and see like what happens. And sometimes you get surprised. Um, Angelica, what would you say about that or, or about any of these things? depends on the property because something that like some things just have like wacky prices and are sitting on the market for a super long time because I don't know why they have that wacky price but in those situations it's sort of like how much would you pay for the house and do you want to put the offer in at that and just see if they go for it and then for other stuff you know I ask the clients what number do you want to end up at like are you willing to pay ask then that's we're going to go in maybe slightly below that, or maybe even slightly above that if it's something you just want to lock down. Um, I've been doing slightly above ask on a lot of properties. It, the sellers just really appreciate that. And when the negotiating, like if you're thinking ahead to like when you do inspection and if you're going to have to ask them to fix things, it's really good to start off on a good note. So it could just be a super bad idea to go in under ask and put the seller in a bad mood. <laughs> Well, and that's actually, okay. So, and that's a really good point. So like, let's say when I'm talking about below ask offers, like, let's say you want to go in at 5,000 below ask or 10,000 below ask that in this market is not worth it. Like if you are that close to ask, then every single time I would do what Angelica said and actually do slightly over. I mean, every time, basically, if you, if you want to, you know, if you want to be aggressive and do like 50,000, you know, 10% below or whatever. Like that's a different story. You're really trying to get more money off. But if you're really close to asking price, because this is what I, this is what I always think about with negotiation. Like whatever makes you feel sick, makes them feel good. And the other way around, like, this is the one part of this that is a zero sum game, like money that you gain, they lose. And your bragging rights about like, oh my God, we got a below ask house you know, is when they lose and all their friends are like, oh my God, this market's crazy. What'd you get? And they're like, you know, sad face. So that's why even if they get, even if they get 3000 above ask, they can be like, yeah, we got above ask. We were thrilled. And, you know, I think that's a really important point is that sometimes you wouldn't want to go below ask if you're close. Um, is there any way to end up in a desired school district if the house is outside of that? Did you know that? I know, I know in Kingston that I, I've, I've heard of some people transferring to the public Montessori school, but I don't know, I have no idea with other school districts. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, you might wanna just call a couple, like if there's some school districts that you're like ringing, like circling, just call them and be like, hey, if I have a house, you know, if I have a place here, is there any way to do it? 
I think that'd be the best thing to do. So I think, oh, Red Hook. Oh, and Red Hook is, well, we're not allowed to say if it's a good school district. I will just say refer to your school district, you know, reports to see if Red Hook is a good school district. Um, so, you know, you're going to start looking at places that look weird online. Somebody posted something yesterday where all the photos were literally upside down. And I was like, okay, that's weird. You know, I'm sure they're going to fix it. But in this moment, you know, like buyers are not, you know, I don't know, maybe that's, maybe people, buyers would look at it because it's such an odd thing, but like for sure, we have, we had a, we had a deal the other day that um, Monica, our uh, senior buyer agent, that she was representing the buyers and the agent had not mentioned that there was a creek that ran in front of the front deck. Didn't mention it, no photo, nor was it mentioned. So they went to the showing, they went to their first showing and they literally were like, holy crap, because a creek up here is like $50,000. You know, it's not like a little bit of money, it's a lot of money. And so that they, they knew right then that they wanted to lock it down. Yeah, so that, that yeah. Oh, Karina just sent a message to me, but yeah, looking, so looking in the areas that aren't popular yet is a, is a good way to get a good price and make you more likely to be able to negotiate. So that's what I was saying, like anywhere, like a town that you don't know, but is like near the towns, you know, that's like, that's absolutely one of the things I would do. And actually even counties, you know, what other county I think has a lot of good value right now is Orange County because Orange County is not a place. I'm already answering your question. Orange County is not a place that like, I mean, it has Warwick, it has a couple like really popular little towns. There, there is hiking there, there's wineries, there's, you know, you're right near Bashakill and the Never Sink Unique area. You could be, I mean, depending on where you are, you could also be close to Storm King. All these, you could be close to, you know, right across the river from Beacon. And, um, but Orange County, I feel like was always like a little far to be a suburb and a little close to be a vacation place in some ways it just feels like it's a little more under the radar. So when I see prices in Orange County, they're often, I mean, they're, they're not necessarily lower, but there's less competition sometimes, unless you're in one of the areas with a really good school district, and then you're like competing in a different thing. But we've sold some really cool houses over there. I mean, actually Karina and I should have gone in on this like sick A-frame with a pool that we sold that I still, actually hadn't thought about for a minute. So I just reopened that wound, um, you know, and it's like, and it was right on the border of Orange and Ulster. And so it was like way cheaper than it would have been, but it was still, you could go to Angry Orchard, you could go hiking. It felt very rural on that street. There was a cute little town nearby. So yeah, absolutely looking, looking in those areas. I mean, the general rule of thumb is the further you go away from the city, the cheaper it gets also. But and because this conversation is not about like the absolute price, but how likely are you to get a price below asking? So if you see an adorable house in a town that's far away, but everybody already knows like Andes or Bovina or I don't know, like Ghent or something like there's still, you're still gonna, you're still gonna be less likely to get a house under the asking price because there's already a ton of people who know and love those areas and who are gonna be looking at them. So that's the other interesting thing. I think that to some extent, and this may not be entirely true, the other, but the other factor to think about is, and I don't know how you would find this out, but would be like the relative density of real estate agents in the area. So, because a lot like our team covers like nine counties, but most agents don't, like they're just like, I work in the Saugerties area, you know, and we'll drive like 20 minutes around and won't even cross the river necessarily. So it feels to me like there is less competition in Southern Ulster and Sullivan. It feels like that a little bit to me, unless you get to like, when you get to the bigger towns, like, or the more popular towns like Narrowsburg, Calico, and Livingston Manor, it like kind of ramps up again, but it just feels like there's less, like there are so many real estate agents and Ulster has I mean, I guess it's just relative population density. Ulster has, are we looking at like all the cats and dogs? <laughs> Stuart. 
Um, Ulster just has a lot more towns, right? So like, if you think about where people could live, like in Ulster, you could be an Asian in Kingston and absolutely show houses in Stone Ridge or Woodstock or Rhinebeck or like all over the place. If you live in like Roscoe or something, it's gonna be a pretty long drive to show things over in Ulster. So it feels like there's maybe a little bit less competition there. It's way less hustle. Yeah, it, it feels like it. Um, so I think that is a good opportunity, you know, and, and I also like, I mean, one of the things that we do when we're looking for houses, I mean, we're telling you to look for the bad photos, like, and it sounds horrible, but like, it's not horrible. It just is what it is. Like we have actual, I have actual agents whose listing I follow. Cause I know they underprice things, you know? So I'm like, Ooh, you know, what's coming up with this person? Like it's going to be underpriced and have bad photos. So we'll be able to like find a buyer for it and not really worry about it. So I think that that's like, I think that those are the, I, you know, with, with out, well, okay. So I already mentioned cash. So however you can have, when you think about the terms of your offer, that's what I wanted to say is that like when sellers look at offers, they look at the, um, the price obviously. And then they look at the terms. They look at everything else all around it. And a seller and if they have a good listing agent, what they're going to be looking at is what's the price and two is how likely are they to get to the closing table and two, part two is how likely are they to get to the closing table at the price we agreed on. And that's like a really important thing. So there are all, I mean, if you, if you think about like the best offer you could possibly give that would give you the best chance at a at below ask it would be cash no inspection as is as is yeah cash and as is closing at seller's convenience yeah i mean closing at seller's convenience you can even add things like let's say it's let's say it's an estate sale and it's full of junk or stuff let's say it's full of stuff lots of stuff and we've gotten we've gotten good deals by being like the seller can leave all of this you guys can leave it all and we'll just like clean it out for you. So sometimes it's stuff that you don't even know that like, again, you have to kind of depend on your agent to find out like what's really important to the seller. It's, you know, it's, again, it's, it's one of the things that like, I don't know. I mean, I think that that's, we're good at that, like having those conversations and trying to figure out like, what are the, what can we do other than increase the price? Um, and there are ways to get your offer closer to ask by like doing things around the appraisal. I mean, sorry, closer to cash, even if you have financing by, you know, having some considerations around that. Um, anything you can do, and this is going to sound weird, but like anything you can do as a buyer to show that you're going to be easy to work with is like, is a big deal. So like, I'm just trying to think of like what a reverse situation has been. Oh, I know. I mean, like, Trying to wait, I'll think of a less recent one. Um, so let's say a buy, like there are two buyers, they have the same, they have the same whatever, like the same price and roughly the same conditions. And one buyer is like, I don't know, like this actually did come up recently. Like we have to know if we can put a bathroom in the basement we're going to put that as a condition of the sale. It's like, okay, great. Like either, you know, that like get a contractor in and find that out before the end of the deadline, you know, before another offer comes in or like nobody's accepting your offer basically. So that's something that's like, cause here it could take like two weeks to get a contractor out to even determine whether you could put a bathroom in the basement. Also, there should be no, you know, technically should be no problem with that, but so it's something that the seller is going to be like, ooh, that sounds a little bit difficult. Or actually another thing that people do, this is a better example, is they ask a million irrelevant questions. So they'll, not irrelevant, like they may be relevant someday, but they're not relevant to the, are we putting an offer in or not? So it'll be like, I don't know. I mean, like one of the questions that, that we get a lot is like, how much does it cost to plow the road? And it's like, that's not bad. Like we tend to have the answer to that, but other people don't necessarily ask their sellers in advance. So all of a sudden they're having to ask their sellers, here's a list of, and we've gotten these from 
we've gotten these from buyers and from buyers agents for sure. Where it's like 25 questions. Like if you were there in your house all winter, what do you think the utilities would be? Like, had you ever gotten a quote for converting your gas stove back to a wood stove? Um, do you know what brand of windows there are? Do you have, like, it's all this stuff. And then the sellers are like, what that indicates is someone who, and I don't even think this is wrong, is that someone, it's someone who might get a little like wacky in the inspection and throughout the whole process, you know, cause if they're already like kind of coming with like a million questions that aren't necessarily like, are you not going to buy the house because of the cost of snow plowing? If that, if the answer is not no, then don't ask, you know, ask later. And like, if you have a, two, if, let's say there's a two mile long driveway, you know what I mean? Something like wacky like that. The, the listing agent probably is going to know because they're going to anticipate that question. But I got to say one other weird one that, that I've realized is actually kind of irrelevant is the cost of utilities. And that's, that's strange because you would think like, why wouldn't you always ask the cost of utilities? But the truth is that like, that is so dependent on how you use the house. If you're there full-time or part-time, if you like to keep it at 72 or at like 55, if you cook a lot or don't cook a lot, what's the price of like gas versus oil that year? Was it a cold winter? Was it a hot summer? So it's like, I, it, you know, it's, it, it seems to me now at this point that like it, that is almost irrelevant. Like if you're looking at like a 5,000 square foot Victorian home and you're like, do I even have money to power, like to power this thing? Maybe then it's worth asking, but there are such minor differences. Either there are such minor differences between houses otherwise, even like kind of new versus old, or it's impossible to figure out because they're used so differently. So you could have a wildly inefficient farmhouse from the 1850s with windows that like are single pane and like insulation made of like old lady stockings or something, you know, and then you could have a new house with like spray foam insulation and brand new windows. And maybe that person likes to keep it at like 85 degrees and they were there full time and the other person wasn't. So it just becomes a little difficult. I'm not saying these are like terrible questions to ask. And that one's, I mean, this is just like a little bit of a sidebar because we all, we almost always ask that question for people. But I will say that like, being like the annoying person up front is like noticed. It is. Or like, and let me say one more, one more thing. Not one more thing, but like an important thing is that like in this market, you are in any market, you're not fully safe until you're under contract. Until you're under contract, theoretically, like there's different, there's a whole bunch of disagreements in, about agents up here, between agents up here and between MLSs up here about like, if what we use is an offer form, can we call the binder? If it's legally binding, if it's never legally binding. So my assumption is it's not. Just assume it's not and then behave as if it's not. The contract definitely is by the way. So once you're under contract, you are under contract. It's pretty hard to break it. But from the moment you put in an offer until you get under contract, I think buyers, you still want to be on good behavior. So like, um, there's two things to that. One is that you're more likely to not have someone come in and put in a higher offer and lose your fun below ask agreed price. If you like move quickly, you got the inspection done quickly, you get things done quickly. Um, you, you just keep moving forward. And then you don't like take a bunch of time. It's the same thing like the snowplow question. It's like, are you not going to buy the house because I don't know, the ice maker doesn't work in the fridge. If the answer is like, nope, I'm I would still move ahead either way. It's like, do not try and ask for like 400 bucks off for the ice maker. Just get to contract. Because that kind of question can like, can literally take three days to resolve. And in that time, in 99.9% .9 of the cases, they are still showing the house right until contract. So you are just leaving the door open to lose your below ask offer. And especially if you've been at all like an, perceived as annoying. I'm not saying you would feel yourself as annoying. Um, oh my God, you have a story too. Goodness. Um, so I think, well, Cece just wrote, I was told that there's not, ah, that's a good thing. There's not a set contract deposit. So the more you offer as a contract deposit, make you more appealing. I, I think it does. I think that like it's somewhere between five and 10%. To me, it's like, if you can put 10% down for the contract deposit, and again, up here, we don't do anything with an offer generally, almost never. 
never so far in my experience. Um, but you do put the money down at contract. That's after inspection. You know you're going ahead with the house. You get it back if you have not waived the financing contingency and you don't get your mortgage for some reason. So I always feel like if you're putting, you know, I mean, if you're if you're ending up with 5% down, then, then, you know, maybe you can only put, obviously, then I would put the whole 5% down as your contract deposit. If you're putting, if you're going to have a 10, 20% down payment, I would absolutely do 10%. Even if you have a 10% down payment, you're going to do a 90, 10 loan where you're financing 90%. I would still do 10% at the beginning because what that would say to me as a listing agent is like, these guys aren't worried about losing this money if they change their minds. And that is the only reason they're losing this money. Like they're not concerned about changing their minds and needing to claw the money back. We had a situation recently where a client wanted to change that amount. And it actually led to a lot of like a big freak out because the sellers were like, why are they changing it? They put 10% down in the, in the offer letter. And now they only want to put 5% down. This is super weird. And it turned out to be like nothing, something super benign. Like their attorney was like, 5% is more common. Why don't you do 5%? And then didn't tell us didn't realize that the client had negotiated 10% down. So it was actually changing something in the existing terms. So it's, it's tricky. Um, um, appraisal is like a whole different topic. We got to kind of probably handle that separately, but the, the answer is that I actually would say that most homes are appraising now. And I would say that that was like, it took a minute for things to catch up, but that most sellers are still nervous about the appraisal. So anything you can do to assuage their fears about like, will help, we'll, we'll, we'll still be able to move forward because of a low appraisal. That is one of the big reasons they would take cash over a financed offer. That's it. But not everybody thinks to ask that. Wait, Jordan, do you wanna like tell us your story? Now I'm like so curious. Sure. Oh, I, I just, I, it's just something that I learned as a buyer. I, um, so I'm sorry, this is a bit of a convoluted transaction. I made an offer directly to the selling agent. The selling agent asked that I'd make it through his wife, who is also an agent, of course. Um, of course we can see there might be a little bit of conflict of interest there, but I obliged. It was a fairly low cost property and the, the sellers were in a pretty distressing situation. So no problem. I made my offer. It was accepted within 24 hours verbally. And then their attorney sent my attorney the contract. And then before the contract was signed, we had the inspection and we had a verbal agreement at the conclusion of the inspection, the, the sellers were there, that they would discount the price by an additional $5,000, which in retrospect is exactly what you said. I probably should not have pushed that $5,000. I'm not sure, given the totality of the circumstances, how much that negotiation derailed things, but it, at least it didn't help. Um, so then I asked my attorney to add a rider for a $5,000 deduction. We signed the contract and went back to their attorney. I thought everything was peachy. And we waited, you know, two days, five days, one week, 10 days, and no signatures came back. And then the real estate agents, I think they just got too frustrated with the sellers to, to deal with it. Plus, I think they're more collaborative with each other than they are with me as the buyer or, or the seller. And so now the property is, depending on where you look, it's pending or under contract. I don't think they're, they're showing it. I don't think they, they will show it at this point because they feel like they backed out of a, oh, I agreed to go back to the original price. That's, a, that's another part. Once they push back on I said, no problem. Let's go back to the original price. We're all good. Um, so now of course I've paid my initial attorney fee and I paid the inspection and, um, they're not going to contract. They're not, not today. Maybe tomorrow. Don't know. Oh, you're still just waiting. Ugh. Yep. Um, and the, the, the realtors have just kind of shrugged and gone on with their lives. So, um, anyway, I just learned that the offer letter, it doesn't mean much. And uh, if I had been more concerned, I should have made sure the contract was signed before we at least went ahead with the inspection. And lastly, in this market, I probably just shouldn't have pushed for that extra $5,000, even though I thought it was warranted given that I don't, I don't, I wasn't nitpicking. It was, certainly was a, a, a home in poor condition, but, um, but you know, it, it, in the grand scheme of things, it wasn't worth it. 
Well, and, and most of the time you have to do inspection before contract. So lo- sometimes it won't even, a lot of people won't let you go to contract here before inspection. It depends on where you are. Some like in Delaware County, they, they'll, they do contract first, but almost everywhere else, the attorneys will actually advise the listing, the both sides against it, because they'll say to the sellers, you go under contract, you take it off the market, you have, you, you basically stop showing it. Like nobody wants to see a home under contract. And then you're negotiating the inspection. It puts them in a terrible negotiation position. And the, the buyer could be like, I want $15,000 for, you know, this loose doorknob. And you're kind of just stuck. And then as a buyer, apparently it can be hard to get your contract deposit back when you're in that situation. So I don't think you'd anything. I mean, Honestly, like this is the thing that's, this is the thing that's so hard. And I think the thing that is helpful to remember is that, I mean, I I feel like I keep saying this, but like, you know, sellers are people, (laughs) agents are people, these are all people. And like, even what's true for somebody two weeks ago may not be true for them today. And that's the part that I always have to remember that I'm like, if I've heard that they're motivated, like who knows, they could win the lottery in between the last time I heard that. And when I want them to sign this contract you know, or they got like an inheritance or their brother wants to buy the place or whatever. So it's like, that's the thing that's kind of hard is that, and what we sometimes do in those, I mean, what we sometimes do to try and move forward quickly is, and this is, I don't know if this, I don't, I I never know if this like helps or not that much, but to say like, you know, the buyer would like to sign the contract. We want to move forward quickly he's requesting $5,000 off, which he feels is fair given these things, which will all be disclosable to the next buyer, but we'll move ahead if you don't do it. And it's actually a third of the time they actually give money off, you know, with something like that. Like if, so if you're sort of like, this is my request, but it's, you know, obviously it's a less strong position to go in. As- yeah. Yeah. Given the fact that we had had a kind of conversation after already all of us together you know I, I felt like we were pretty much on the same page but I think you're right I mean conditions change this is clearly a family in, in quite a bit of turmoil much you know totally separate from their real estate transaction nothing to do with you know my interaction with them um, so anyway we'll see I just I just didn't understand that I was didn't have any recourse there and as I've you know educated myself a bit more I see yeah you don't really have any recourse until the contract is signed and you will have to spend some money and of course quite a lot of time to uh, figure things out before you get there and you do so as a buyer and you can talk to an attorney about this but there are some things like you you might not have official recourse but there are some things that you can do to make the seller's lives pretty difficult if they renege on an offer mm-hmm. i want to talk to your attorney about options so right i'm not talking about like you know teeping their house there's some legal options <laughs> but yeah i think it's a I think that's the thing is like, like we get to a point, like when people are like, we want it, we want this house. We're just like, okay, like how do we get from here to contract? Like the quickest way, yeah. Yeah. you know, like how do we just like, and because the, the problem is that we're not under, nobody's under, nobody has any control over a huge amount of that process. So it's like, how long does it take for like the seller's attorney to draft the contract? How long does it take for your attorney to review the contract? How long does it take for, I mean, that is, we tell people that average, I think this is true from an accepted offer to contract is at least three weeks because you have 10 days to do inspection. And then they like go back and forth doing the contract. So that's, so to me, like the normal case scenario is that you're kind of exposed for three whole weeks, Mm -hmm. which is, not great and but it gets a little bit to you know angelica's point too of like this is where i this is also why i don't have a like why i like doing dual agency where i like when we're not technically representing either side and we're doing we're just working to keep the transaction moving forward because i think in general i don't want i don't want the buyer or the seller to be kind of bummed like everybody should be, maybe they're a little bummed in a negotiation. Like they didn't get hundred percent what they want, but you know, they should be pretty happy with what they're getting because otherwise it's like, it's like you want this, like, see like the goodwill that you've built up is like a pot of gold and that you, maybe you never need to cash it in during the transaction. And that's great. You never needed it, but you might need to, like, let's say there's a title issue or something comes up and like, or you like, I don't know, really love their like porch swing or something and they like decided to take it like I mean it just it's always like 
it's just good to have everybody be happy. And so for me, it's like $5,000 gets to the point where like, I'm not willing to pay for people to be happy necessarily. But if it was like $2,000, you know, I'd be like, okay, I'll probably like, and then, and then as their agent, I would make like a super big deal about it and be like, oh my God, my clients are amazing. Look at all these like things that I'm telling you. So now you have to disclose them. Here's the points, here are the parts of the inspection report that they're not even going to negotiate for. Gosh, we, you know, we, they really did some soul searching and we've gotten them down to these requests. So that it actually is seen as like, you're actually being a champion because you asked for 5,000 instead of 25,000. Doesn't always help, but it can. Ooh, look at this. Look at it. New questions. I love questions. So much fun. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. And I think it's going to get signed. That's my vibe. I think oh, I just yeah, no hashtag upstate life. We'll see. Yeah, it's, it's fine. Stewie, Stewie, feels, Stewie feels like it's promising. Right, Stewie? We have like landscapers, contractors out here. He's all kinds of agitated today. Um, also next time, just call us to represent you. Yeah. No, I, 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 should have, I really thought this transaction would go down easy. And it's honestly a smaller dollar amount than a lot of the houses that you guys handle. And uh, pretty like, you know, one of these distressed properties. But I definitely should have. I should not have gone with the wife. That was not juicy. <laughs> um, okay, so Shaw writes, we're buying in Rosendale, it's seven minute ride to Stockade. House is pretty secluded, so we love it. Why does it feel like Rosendale's still behind on prices than say New Paltz and High Falls? Super new to upstate. And to me, so many areas are cute, but um, why are some little towns more desirable to my fellow Brooklynites? So, um, well, New Paltz, we're not allowed to talk about good school districts, but you may review the school district rankings for towns such as New Paltz. Um, that is a particular case. New Paltz is also a college town. There's a ton of like professors live there and students live there. So it's just like always been more expensive. The taxes are much more expensive too. Um, I don't think Rosendale's, I don't think Rosendale's cheaper than High Falls. I don't think it is. I don't notice, I don't notice that. I love Rosendale. I think it's adorable. I think it has the cutest main street ever. I think the location is amazing because it's between all these different things. Um, I think maybe it just, maybe Rosendale has more houses that are close to other houses. So when you look at like average prices, houses that are close to other houses are always cheaper. So like, you know, so if you look at like the neighborhoods in Rosendale, you know, if you, if you look at something on like Creek Locks Road instead, which is like a beautiful road looking at a creek, it's not gonna be cheaper. I mean, High Falls just doesn't have that many like houses that are in the village, I would say. Yeah, no, I, I don't think, I don't think it's behind. If it is, then more power to you because honestly, I think it's great. And I think it's like, once a movie theater opens up again and there's a cute little farmer's market and there's great food there, there's the creek, there's the rail trail, there's the trestle, you are in Kingston in two minutes, it's amazing. Um, Oh, okay, great. Okay, it's two o'clock, but I do wanna answer this. So what about the case where the house being sold has tenants in it? That's actually another good example of when you might be able to get a house under asking price right now. Because if someone is selling something with tenants, while there is still a do not evict policy, they must have a reason to wanna to sell it now. Like there must be just some good reason because that do not evict policy is terrifying for most landlords. So to take people on right now, especially if it's under market rent, and it looks like, I mean, we don't know how long that'll be continued, maybe summer, who knows, maybe not. Um, but that is also where, so if you're willing to take something on that other people aren't, like tenants or, um, I don't know, maybe there's like a zoning thing. Like we had, we had a client who had like an issue with a house being classified as a three season dwelling instead of a four season dwelling that had to be cash in that case. But you know, when that, when that emerged, they were able to get it below ask because it was going to be such a pain. And if we had to put it back on the market, it was going to be like, it was going to have to be for less money because that made a huge difference. Um, so Evelyn, thank you for asking that question, actually, because I think that like the, one of the real opportunities to get something below ask and to get a good deal in general is to, is to take on something that's going to scare other people, whether that's a certain amount of work, whether that's whatever it is. So yeah, so I think it's still, you know, I mean, not like, I think it's still possible. It is still possible to get a house below ask. So I think that like, and I would say that don't assume, 
don't assume that a house that's been on the market for a long time has something wrong with it. Even I've seen this a million times and I know this and I still assume it. Like my gut is always like, must be something wrong with it. Next, I had clients who got a house. This one still kills me. This house had been listed for like $2 million and oh my God, what's the town that's that has Harney and Sons? Is that Millerton? Millerton. Yeah, which is mm, so cute. So cute and right near Metro North and everything. So they got this house. It had been listed for like, I think it was like close to $2 million. By the time we saw it, it was like one, two. It's a straight up like mansion on like, I mean, gorgeous on like an amazing river practically. And you could walk to town on the rail trail. And then it had an A-frame also. Like that was like way over. It had a ton of land. It had an A-frame as well. We put in a crazy offer. I mean, our offer was, we just put in like 750 or something. And they ended up getting that house for like 850. That had been on the market for like two and a half years. It had been overpriced for so long that I think people had stopped looking at it. Didn't even realize it had gotten down to one, two. And one, two to like 750, most people would not put in an offer like that. Like I was definitely nervous when we did. But I was like, I don't know. I'm get, getting the vibes that maybe there's a lot of flexibility here that something has changed. And it did. And those guys got the screamingest deal I've ever seen. So that to me was my, and when they first showed it, the clients found this one. And when they showed it to me, I was like, yo, something has to be wrong. Look, it's been on the market for two and a half years. And now they're like laughing all the way to the bank. So that's it. Angelica, you have any like last points or anything that you think? Yeah, any help that's like less desirable. Like it's close to a road. It's really basic. It's near a neighbor. Like those are ones that the vast majority of people aren't gonna jump on. So you might have a better chance of getting a better price on those. And like, I mean, how much time are you spending in the house when you're upstate? Like you're out doing all the upstate stuff. So do you really care that you might hear some traffic sometimes? It's not that busy up here. Well, and and we've seen, we've actually seen houses that are pretty base, basic feeling you can make them super cute, super cute. And actually one of the things, and this is something that a lot of people don't want to do. So this is another case where you could get below ask is if somebody's renovated it with really bad, like builder grade materials, because most people look at it and go, I cannot rip out floors that have just put in and kitchen cabinets that have just been put in and whatever. And it is like an environment. I mean, I'm not saying this is not like an environmental travesty. It is, but you can't. And you can give the cabinets to Ulster County Restore, takes all those things, you know? So like, cause those houses, like when you see that house and you're like, Ugh, those are the houses that other people probably are doing that same thing with. And then you get a really good deal. So that's it. So I hope everybody has a good rest of the day and I wish everybody a ton of luck with all this stuff. And like, I feel like I should have like a catchphrase, like, everybody gets a house. Well, that sounds like Oprah. Um, but you know what I mean? Like if you want a house and you're also Johnny and Scott are my best audience ever, and they're going to have to come to every zoom. Like I only make jokes to watch them laugh. Just know that. <laughs> so like, it's like the opposite of the two grumpy old men for the Muppets. You guys are like the two happy guys in the corner. Of my zoom. <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, that's the point. It's like, if you're realistic, you're gonna get a house. You're totally getting a house. You're gonna, it's gonna be great. You're gonna be up here. It's gonna be amazing. You get a house, you get a house. It's true. It's true. Everybody gets a house. So um, yeah, but you know, I haven't wanted to like pitch that crap out of like our team the whole time, but I actually genuinely do think that we are really effing good at this stuff and that the agents on our team are really effing good at this stuff. And we have very long, rigorous hiring processes and training processes and accountability things. And we have all different kinds of things because we want to get better at it all the time. So oh my God, I got to like copy CC's TikTok before there. Now it's copied. So now I can stop, stop the Zoom. So thank you all for coming. And um, yeah, we'll talk again soon. Bye. Bye.